warriors, athletes, artists and colonialists, sailors and pirates, traders and philosophers, the ancient Greeks never cease to make creative trouble for themselves and in their talent for creation and destruction we recognize ourselves. The rise of Greek civilization, this time on the Western tradition. Now UCLA professor Eugen Weber's continuing journey through the history of Western civilization. The Western tradition really begins with the Greeks. Our kind of institutions, our kind of thinking, even our kind of sinning are all connected with the rationalism of the Greek mind. The Greeks did not take the world on trust. They did not attribute it to the will of God they did not abandon themselves to fate. Instead, they asked questions and came up with answers. The Greek philosopher Plato once wrote that philosophy is the child of wonder. It was the gift of the Greeks that they inquired into the things that excited their wonder and their insatiable curiosity paid off in instability in insecurity, but also in greatness. Let's begin with a Greece of 3,200 years ago, around 1200 BC, when a series of invasions and wars shook the ancient world from Anatolia to Egypt. This is a scene from the Odyssey. Most of what we know about the 400 years between 1200 and 800 BC comes from the Odyssey and from another epic poem, the Iliad, both attributed to the Greek poet Homer. The first poem, the Iliad, tells how the Greeks besieged and destroyed Troy, an Asian city near the Hellespont. The second poem, the Odyssey, depicted in this Roman wall painting, tells what happened after the Trojan War to Odysseus, the king of Ithaca and a leader of the Greeks. It's likely that the world both poems describe was similar to the actual period between 1200 and 800 before Christ, a sort of Dark Ages. Dark, because we know so little about them, but also because life was even more brutish and short than usual. We see a society of warriors and petty chiefs, greedy for honor and riches, ruthless, highly competitive, but with a code of behavior which provides an enduring formula for distinction in later times, that of heroism, nobility, eventually chivalry. By the 8th century BC, the heroic quest for glory had been ritualized by the Greeks in great competitive games. We know this best from the games established at Olympia in 776 before Christ. The Greek name for the games was Argon, the word for contest or competition from which our word agony derives. The honor you strove for was so high that neither agony nor even life were too high a price to pay for winning. On the other hand, 
the Greek athletes were realistic as well as materialistic. Athletes faced the agony of competition because they wanted to win prizes. A winner might well be fed, clothed, possibly housed at his city's expense for the rest of his life, and he would pay no taxes. Later, through the centuries, the Greek athlete's very sensible way of looking at competition was going to be sterilized by people who thought that material concerns were base. Noble sacrifice was what they wanted to see, not worldly ambition, and so the image of the athlete agonistes, the athlete suffering in his quest, this became an important part of the Greco-Roman culture. It was taken up by the early Christians, who were a part of that culture, of course, and who were engaged in a terrible wrestling match with the devil and with evil. And then it was going to be revived by the Protestants in the 16th century and the Victorians in the 19th century and it's still with us today, as you can see in the disapproval of modern fans when they discover that their heroes are business people as much as they are athletes. The heroic values that the Iliad and the Odyssey expressed have come down to our own day nearly 3,000 years later. But that doesn't mean the Homeric hero is anything like the medieval knight, say, who blunders into battle for honor's sake. The Homeric hero may be noble, but he is also shrewd. Odysseus, whom you see here as he blinds the monster Cyclops, Odysseus is not just a good sailor and a fine athlete, he's also quick-witted and crafty, a master of deceit and artful tales, as the Greek goddess Athena tells him more in praise than blame. Athena compares Odysseus to herself, saying, you are far the best of all mortals in counsel and speech, and I am celebrated among all gods in craft and cunning. Which tells you something not only about Greek heroes, but also about Greek religion. Their gods like Pluto and Persephone here may have been supernatural and superhuman, but they were otherwise like men and women with human physiology and human passions. This humanization of the gods was something new, a revolution in religion. Gods were to be honored as men were, with palaces like this one in Sicily, where they could live and keep the offerings they got and be worshipped. But only gods would be worshipped, not pharaohs, not kings. For unlike Persians, the Greeks worship no man as master, only the gods. So now, for the first time, man is the measure of all things, as the Greek philosopher Protagoras said in the 5th century before Christ. This was an extraordinary assertion to make, in a world where normal men and women still seemed very puny and probably felt very puny in an immensely vast, immensely mysterious universe of which they knew almost nothing. And yet in the same era we come upon an Athenian statesman, Pericles, extolling not just men but free men and the advantages of individual liberty. We live as free citizens, says Pericles, not only in our public life, but in our attitude to one another in the affairs of daily life. 
We are not angry at our neighbor if he behaves as he pleases. We do not cast sour looks at him, which, if they do no harm, cause pain. The ruins of Athens remain monuments to Pericles' vision of his city as a center for art, literature, and wonderful architecture. But Athens was only one of hundreds of Greek city-states in the 5th century before Christ, each of which was called a polis, meaning both city and state, but also commonwealth, a body of citizens in an autonomous fatherland. These polis spread from the Black Sea to the Western Mediterranean. The heaviest concentration was on the Greek mainland, on the islands, and in Ionia on the western coast of Asia Minor, where the richest and most advanced cities had grown in the 7th and 6th centuries BC, because they were closest to the trade and the culture of the Middle East. The scale of Polis was small, partly because of geography. Greece, Ionia and the islands are checkerboards of mountains, valleys and small plains which tends to make for isolated settlements that have easier access to the surrounding sea than to one another. So the sea became the Greek highway par excellence. It was on the sea that Greeks sailed, traded, raided, pirated. But Polis, like Selinus, the ruins of which we see here, were also small because the Greeks thought they should be small. Plato thought the ideal city should have 5,000 citizens, which really meant a population of 20,000 or so, not counting a few resident aliens. Women, Foreigners and slaves, of course, had no civic rights in ancient Greece, but then that was true of most of the world until the 19th century. As it turned out, some polis were very tiny, and only three in the 5th century BC had more than 20,000 citizens, that is about 100,000, Athens foremost among them. But whatever its size, each Greek polis had its own personality, laws, patriotism, and at the same time, each shared in the common pride of being Hellenes, part of the world of Hellas, which is not a nation or a race, but a cultural community and a very powerful concept. The Homeric myth attributes the community of Hellas to a common ancestor, a hero called Helen or Helenus, and then to common action in the Trojan War. Historically, however, this sense of community was probably precipitated by the extraordinary experience of the Persian Wars. Between the middle of the 6th century BC and the beginning of the 5th, the Greeks provoked and then withstood the immense might of the Persian Empire. They defeated the Persians not once, but several times, most notably at Marathon in 490 BC, at Salamis in 480, and finally at Plataea in the following year. Marathon and Plataea were great victories for what the Greeks called hoplites, disciplined, heavy-armed infantry fighting in close formation. These hoplites would become the basis of Greek military success for the next 200 years. But Marathon and Plataea were also great victories for the notion of community. The squabbling Greek polis 
had to bury their differences and join together against the foreign barbarians who didn't speak Greek, but something that sounded like ba ba ba. As Themistocles, the Athenian commander, said after the Greeks had ripped the Persian fleet to shreds at Salamis, it is not we who have done this, meaning not we Athenians, but all Greeks together, all Hellas. And out of these victories, an awareness would grow of Greece and of a common Greek spirit which hadn't existed before. It was a critically important impulse to Greek confidence, indeed, to Greek civilization. We can talk about a Greek civilization because despite geographical dispersion, political fragmentation, endless bloody conflicts, the Hellenes shared a strong cultural unity in language, in common myths, in similar customs, you might say in a common cultural personality. No matter what polis they lived in, they were quick to adopt skills and practices they found useful and then improve them and make them their own. They took the Phoenician alphabet, they added vowel sounds and they turned it into Greek. They didn't invent pottery, but they individualized it. By the 6th century BC, potters and other artists were signing their work, a revolutionary step that proclaimed the artist as an individual. They copied a freestanding statue from Egypt, but they liberated and they humanized its form and they painted it, which made it more lively. And they also invented the nude as an art form, one more assertion of human confidence. By the 5th century BC, the Greek cultural personality had affirmed itself in a very grand enterprise indeed, the Acropolis, the hilltop citadel of Athens. In 480 BC, the Persians had burnt Athens, and although the city was quickly reoccupied and patched up, it continued to look a mess for the next 30 years, until, that is, Pericles decided to rebuild the Acropolis, which became the seat of the gods, with a great new temple, the Parthenon. Inside, a giant statue was raised of the goddess Athena to bear witness to her power and the power of Athens itself. This was all done so quickly, within 11 years, that the technical tour de force impressed the Greeks as much as the grandeur of the result. The man who made this frieze was the Parthenon's artistic director, Phidias, considered one of the great sculptors of antiquity. We have some of his great works and we have the work of other sculptors done in the Phidias style. Most critics then as now admire the restraint, the nobility and the harmony that make them examples of the ideal and idealistic classical style. This is the work of another sculptor, Praxiteles, who worked 100 years after Phidias in mid-4th century BC. Praxiteles liberated the rather stiff classical shapes and warmed them up, which they needed, as you can see from this Aphrodite of Knidos. The Greeks had come a long way since the heroic age of Homer. 
not only in art and culture, but also in politics, a word, of course, derived from polis. By the end of the 6th century before Christ, most of the polis had cast off the rule of kings and princes and tried a variety of governments. There was tyranny, a kind of constitutional dictatorship not necessarily unpopular. There was aristocracy, the rule of the best or the best born. And oligarchy, the rule of the few. And democracy, the rule of the demos, the people, the crowd. Or there was some combination of these, as in the Athens of Pericles. In Athens, all citizens had equal rights, but, as Pericles wrote in the 5th century before Christ, when a man is distinguished in any way, he is more highly honored in public life, not as a matter of privilege, but as a recognition of merit. On the other hand, anyone who can do the city good is not debarred by poverty or by the obscurity of his position. Pericles isn't meant to be taken literally, of course. Aristocracy wasn't really the rule of the best men, but rather of a few leaders drawn from old wealthy families. And democracy wasn't really the rule of all the people, but only a few thousand free-born men. Still, a poor Athenian like Demosthenes could become a political leader in the 4th century BC. And we can see in his success that even an ideal can define values and encourage aspirations which in turn can affect and change society. Because the way the Greeks chose leaders and the way they were ruled was apt to change, the Greeks also had a sense of history. It is no accident that the greatest historian of antiquity, Thucydides, was Greek. History is about men, women, institutions changing in time and space, and Thucydides saw change all around him in the 5th century BC. Unlike the Egyptians, who were so impressed by continuities and long chronologies, Unlike the Mesopotamians, who were so impressed by supernaturally induced catastrophes, Thucydides was more interested in the discernible motives of men's actions. He attributed decisions and actions and outcomes to objective factors like culture and economics, instead of supernatural intervention. Of course, most Greeks were not as objective. They were mostly peasants, small farmholders, craftsmen, artisans, often rooted in custom, superstition, and narrow localism. But the Persian invasions of the 6th century BC and the great national struggle against the Persian Empire in the 5th century brought the first inkling that perhaps it was better to die than to be a slave, that it might make sense to face death not just for your own home, but, incredible as it sounds, for other people's homes, even for the homes of those wretched people in the next village. That a common humanity or a common Hellenism might be more important than your own local customs and prejudices. There were also greater men who seemed even more important, the men that everybody was talking about. 
There was Themistocles, who commanded the Athenian fleet in the great victory over the Persians at Salamis in 480 BC, the victory that saved Greece. There was Aristides the Just, a contemporary of Themistocles, who administered the finances of Athens and the finances of its allies so honestly. There was Miltiades, the hero of Marathon, and Hecateus of Miletus, who made a picture of the earth, showing all the countries and the cities and the rivers, and Pythagoras, the wise teacher who discovered so much about numbers and about the wickedness of the world. What was it about these men that made them so different from the farmers who met in the Agora on market day? It was Sophia, wisdom. It was Arete, virtue. These famous men were not so much stronger or bigger or richer or better born. They were just wise, and that is why they were better men. But, if that were true, wasn't it possible for others to become wise like them? Couldn't even a peasant learn? There were a lot of Greeks who thought this might be possible. And from that kind of thinking, there evolved a way of looking at the world that helped to shape the future course of Western culture. And we shall see this in our next program. Mm -hmm.